Look, there are, uh, there are desktop studies suggesting that, that macroalgae farming, uh, kelp farming, may be a useful way to go. You know, kelp grows 30 to 60 times faster than land-based plants, uh, can grow half a metre a day. Um, there are large parts of the oceans where you could have floating seaweed farms. Uh, if we could cover 9% of the world's oceans with seaweed farms, you'd draw down the equivalent of all global emissions going up as of 2015. So we're never going to get to you know, 9% of the world's ocean covered in seaweed farms by 2050. That's, that'd be an area four and a half times the size of Australia. Very, very large. But you see there an approach that offers us a way forward at scale. Beyond that, there is the use of silicate rocks. Uh, these are a natural part of Earth's system for drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, as they weather, they absorb CO2. If you were to enhance the weathering process by quarrying the rock and then grinding it up and strewing it on beaches and so forth, if you did that with five or six gigatons of silicate rock, you'd be drawing three or four gigatons of CO2 out of the atmosphere. Of course, at the moment, we burn fossil fuel to quarry, so we have to green up our energy supply before we can apply that at scale. Um, but there are also things like carbon negative concretes. I mean, concretes are responsible for 5% of global emissions. The, the development of carbon negative concretes offers a huge opportunity now to both avoid emissions in the making of cements and concretes, but also to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere into the concretes as they cure and, and mature. Uh, there are direct technologies such as um, uh, plastics from atmospheric CO2, the manufacture of carbon fibres from CO2, and these again open significant opportunities. Hard to imagine them at the gigaton scale, but they are there. On top of all of that, we have to look at some of the carbon capture technologies, which are also quite interesting.